All right, so thank you again for joining. Um, the purpose of today, today's webinar is to teach you the necessity um, items that you need to know in starting a phlebotomy school. Doesn't matter what state you're in, honestly, um, although this was geared for Ohio, um, the information is pretty much the same. Why? Because unlike CNA schools, phlebotomy schools are not as heavily regulated. So um, a lot of the information is very broad information that can be used no matter where you are. Miss um, Nunnery, I know you're in Texas. Miss Blake, where are you at? I am in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, so how to start a phlebotomy training program. These are the items we're gonna go over and that we'll talk about in depth. Um, that is the body or the authority for the state that you're in, uh, national certification alignment and what that means, a length of the program, how long it should be, any of the content that should be inside of that course, what the qualifications are to be an instructor, and then some, some state documents that you'll need to craft on your own throughout this process. <clears throat> so who am I? Uh, I'm Victoria Randall. I am a family nurse practitioner, and I was once upon a time a CNA and was a CNA for seven years. Then I became a nurse, and I've been one for the past third well, I was one for 13 years, and then for the past six years, I've been a nurse practitioner. I uh, started my own CNA school in 2015, started this company, The Secret Cocktail, in 2020, and we have started, I think, three phlebotomy schools now, um, mostly in the state of Georgia, and we got one up and going in Ohio. Um, so that's why we are here. Actually, and, and no, I'll take that back, four, because we just got one approved in Texas a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago. Um, this is a few members of our team. So from left to right, we have Tracy uh, and Tamira. They're both program specialists, uh, myself in the middle. Amy on the far, uh, I'm sorry, Amy on the right of me is our director of operations. And then on the far end is Deja. She is our um, train the trainer program coordinator, as well as a program specialist with our company. Our program specialists basically help us write curriculum and help us get um, all the application things that you need for your training school. Um, welcome, Ms. Hicks. What state are you in? I'm in Ohio. Ohio. Okay, thanks for joining. All right, we've consulted to start over 100 healthcare training schools um, throughout the nation. And these are just a few of the schools to name a few. Um, Ann Mutt Nursing School right here is actually in Illinois. Uh, Sovereign Care is in Indianapolis. Williams Career Center Excellence is in Texas. And then Resilient Healthcare, that's in Arizona, just to name a few. So we we operate on a national level and we pretty much have worked everywhere. Um, remember I told you I started my own school. So this is New Beginnings Career Center. This is our um, grand opening day. <clears throat> and this is me with my first class of students. But then here's some grand openings of the other schools um, that I've been to to help create as well. Uh, this particular school, Unique Health School, is located in Virginia, and we got them a CNA school, and we actually just got them, uh, helped them get approved for an LPN program, which was big. That was our very first LPN program, so we've kind of dibbled and dabbled in that to see what that looks like, and we actually got that approved. Um, so although we're not offering that as an ongoing service to all of our clients right now, we are still on the phases of conducting research to see what that looks like in every state. That was Virginia, it's different in every state like CNA schools. All right, I'm gonna tell you our mission because I think it's important that since you guys are creating a business, you need to think about what your mission is also. Uh, missions are very important, not just for customers to know what it is that you do and what your values are, but also internally so that people within your organization can all share that idea. And it also keeps you aligned as a company because sometimes you can find yourself like veering off and doing other things that you weren't necessarily trying to do initially. And your mission can always bring you back to your um, target offering. So our mission statement um, is to provide customized consulting to help create, to help clients create their desired healthcare training schools while saving them time and money in the process. So that is our mission. Um, anybody have a mission for their school that they can think of that they may want to share? Anybody? All right. If you go ahead, Ms. Blake. No, I was going to say not yet. I'm coming up with one, but not okay. quite. <laughs> yeah, that should be a part of your business planning. So keep keep thinking about that. Look at other uh, mission statements and think about how you can align your statement for your company and your target customer. All right. Um, these are some of our goals. So in your company, you should always have goals that you're trying to achieve. 
Um, our goals are to try our best to get it done right the first time, to streamline the process for our clients, to help our clients save money by preventing costly mistakes. Let's just say preventing. And then also provide a listening ear so that we can customize uh, the client experience. It is our goal to be the premier healthcare training consulting firm in the nation. And I think we've already achieved that. Um, to provide engaging learning sessions to enhance real life application, as well as create a space where clients can feel comfortable and empowered and heard. So those are our um, company goals. Think about your goals. And then, um, as I always say, the great thing about entrepreneurship is that you can make as much money as you want. There is no cap to the amount of money you can make. So you are doing the right thing um, and thinking about starting a business or moving forward to start a business. All right, so let's get to it. The Department of Higher Education. So this is going to be the body that has authority over your um, training program. And since we have a small audience here, I'm actually going to share with each of you um, your body. <laughs> so I have um, two Ohio's and a Texas. Uh, I know, Ms. Nunnery, you know who your body of authority is. That's the Texas uh, Workforce Commission. Um, but let me go ahead and share my screen for everyone. So if you go to our website, which is thesecretcocktail.com, and then you go here to this little hamburger menu and you click on state requirements, it's gonna bring you to this website. And this website has every single state uh, in the United States. And if we go to Ohio, <clears throat> you'll see that uh, for nurse aid training programs, that's not what we're doing, we're doing phlebotomy. So the next one is the Ohio Department of Career Colleges and Schools. So we would click that and it's actually going to take you directly to a new school approval process. See there? So if you are wondering, well, what does it take for me to start a phlebotomy school or what are the steps? You just come straight here and you go through this process, read through this and understand what's required. Um, the same is going to be required for Texas. And I, um, as I go through these, I'll explain. But of course, catalog or a catalog list, that's going to be required pretty much no matter what state you're in, because this is a college essentially that you're creating. And every college has a uh, course catalog of all the things that they offer, all their policies and procedures for their students to look at before enrolling in the program. Uh, every program should have, a, uh, every college rather, should have an enrollment agreement. Uh, every college should have a surety bond and et cetera. So I'm going to talk about some of these things later, but I just wanted you to see that this is your entire application process for Ohio. Um, for Texas, the, yours is the Texas Workforce Commission. And again, when you click that link, it takes you right to the Texas Workforce Commission's website, and you'll go through and pick all of the options that are for a new program. Um, it's a lot more paperwork in Texas than it is Ohio, but um, it's still manageable. All right, next, <clears throat> let me go back to my presentation. All right, so the Department of Higher Education, I just showed you who your Department of Higher Education is. Um, in some states, it's called a Commission on Higher Education, the Board of Regents, a private vocational school, a post-secondary school, an occupational school, or a career education school. And if you saw in Ohio, for you guys, it was a career education school. Um, I believe in Texas, it is a uh, private vocational school. But anyway, all these mean exactly the same thing, and that's that you have a license to operate a school. And once you get a license to operate a school, guys, you can actually put any type of certificate, uh, non-degree granting program in your school, which is awesome. So I know we're thinking about phlebotomy right now, but you can do a world of HVAC, uh, massage therapy, cosmetology, um, patient care tech, anything inside or outside of healthcare, as long as there is a certificate associated with it. All right, next, um, in order to start a phlebotomy school, there is a national certifying body that you have to get approval, uh, not approval, but that you're going to align with, and that's a difference. So you don't have to necessarily get approval, you wanna align with it, meaning you're going to tailor all of your curriculum, you're going to tailor all of your, um, your testing, all of that is gonna be catered around this particular certifying body because this is where your students are going to go and test to get their national certification to be a phlebotomist. 
So uh, here we have the list. We have the National Healthcare Association, which is also known as NHA. They are actually the gold standard. So uh, we use NHA whenever we write any of our curriculums. We use their requirements. Um, typically, their requirements are that students who go to sit for their exam has to have at least 30 live sticks, successful sticks on real people, as well as 10 capillary sticks, um, successful capillary sticks on real people. Next, we have the National Phlebotomy Association. The National Phlebotomy Association, um, they, are, they are kind of like in a body that you would have to align with and have to get approval through. So with National Phlebotomy Association, you actually have to have your instructors go through their program um, become an instructor, and then you have to adopt their curriculum, which of course there's a fee for that and et cetera. So their system is a little different. They want you to adopt their items so that you can constantly pay them, you know, a fee for whatever it is. It's their book, their curriculum, things like that. So anyway, I'm not going to go through all these, write these down, take a screenshot. Um, you will want to reach out to these different certifying bodies to find out which national certifying body you would want to align your program with. Keep in mind that when um, phlebotomists or phlebotomy technicians go through your program, the phlebotomy tech program, they don't necessarily have to become certified in order to work. So a lot of hospitals will take people who have the experience, even though they're not certified. So keep that in mind. And that's something also you'll be writing in your um in your course catalog, that when students go through your program, you're aligned with NHA. Students can take the NHA exam after your graduation from your program. However, it is not required and they may not need it depending on the employer. So I think that's um, some good information to know there. All right, um, next we have the length of the program. So the length of the program can be anywhere between 120 hours usually is the bare minimum. And I've seen some programs go all the way up to 200. We write our program for 120 um, at the Secret Cocktails. So all of our programs that we create are around 120, but you can be anywhere in that range. There's no, there's no guidance that says your program has to be so long. All right, next is course content. So you may be asking yourself, well, what exactly all will we be teaching in the phlebotomy program? So your students will actually learn the following. They're going to learn basic human anatomy and physiology. A lot of times they have to learn about the heart, um, the veins, vessels, arteries, how they flow throughout the body, but then they also need to learn about other body systems too. Because did you guys know that phlebotomists, phlebotomy technicians not only collect blood specimens, but they also collect other specimens like urine, stool, and sputum. Did you guys know that? Yes. Mm-hmm, okay. <clears throat> so, they need to know um, about the human anatomy and physiology so they can do those other tests as, all, as well. <clears throat> now, they will also need, um, there are different types of tests that they need to learn about. They need to do blood draw techniques, specimen collection techniques, and they also have to learn about point of care testing. Uh, quite often, phlebotomy technicians may also even do urine dips on the spot and et cetera. So they would need to learn how to do that. So you'll be teaching all of that. All right, who can teach? Before I go there, um, anybody want to guess who can teach the phlebotomy program? Who can teach? I think as long as you get the course, like, isn't that like an instructor course that you take? So remember, not all national certifying bodies require you to take a course. So you won't necessarily have to take a course. So, so you have to be a phlebotomist to teach a course or have experience? Right, yep. So you don't have to be a nurse to teach phlebotomy. You can be a medical assistant because they have phlebotomy background. You can be a phlebotomist. You can be an LPN or an RN. Um, so those are usually the main four that can teach this course. You want to keep in mind um, as a business owner, you'll want to ask yourself, if I'm hiring an instructor to teach this course, 
what is going to be the most cost effective way for me to do that? So even though as, a, as, an, as an RN, if you're an RN or an LPN, you may be qualified to teach it, but your time may be better spent elsewhere. So you'll also want to identify, well, who can I hire to help me teach this program? And uh, an RN probably won't be the most cost effective individual. It probably would be a medical assistant or a phlebotomist. So please keep in mind that you can hire a phlebotomist or a medical assistant for the program. They have to have at least one year of experience, at least, and they have to be certified. Uh, or it's highly recommended that they're certified because if they're teaching a program that gives a certification designation, then, you know, it it's only common sense that they would have to have um, that certification themselves. I have seen in extreme cases where maybe there was a phlebotomist who had been a phlebotomist for 20 plus years, they never got certified, but because they have so much experience in the field, they're able to teach. Also, I didn't mention this, but when we think about um, EMTs, paramedics, uh, they have to do blood draw, they, should, they would qualify to teach as well. Don't know that they would be the most cost effective from a budgeting standpoint, but they could teach as well. All right, so remember I told you there's all these state documents that you have to uh, create for the program. And I wanna acknowledge uh, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson, thank you so much for joining. What state are you in? You with us, Ms. Johnson? What state are you in? Okay, she's not with us. <laughs> all right. So most states require these items that I'm labeled right here for you to submit and it's a part of the application process. So typically you would have to create a syllabus. Now, if you don't know how to create a syllabus, guess what? I have a video on my YouTube station that walks you through exactly how to do a syllabus. So if you want that information, you can go right on over there to get it. So let me show you real quick my YouTube channel. Welcome. All right, and let me screen share for you. So when you go to the Secret Cocktails um, YouTube channel and you go down here, here it is, how to create a syllabus, how to create a course outline, and then um, any topic you're wanting to know about, did you guys know you can just click on this little magnifying glass and, top, and type it in? So let's say I wanted to know something about LPNs. Well, everything that I ever talked about that has something to do with an LPN will pop up here. Yeah. Hey there, Ms. Wood. Hey, hello, hello, Ms. Johnson. Hi, how are you? How are you? Good. What states how are you, you in? I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. And then, Ms. Uh, Johnson, where are you from? I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio as well. Cincinnati. Okay. Thank you, ladies, for joining. <clears throat> Um, also, if you were looking for something here that had to do with phlebotomy, you would type in phlebotomy and any of the videos that I had that said something about phlebotomy are here. So uh, I recognize a lot of people don't know that you can do that on the YouTube channel. Just wanted to show you that you could do that. Um, but more importantly, we came here <clears throat> because I wanted to show you the syllabus video. So there's a video that walks you through how to create a syllabus right here. I try to give you guys as much tools and information as I can to help you get the job done. All right, so syllabus was there. Uh, course catalog. Now I did not create a video on course catalog because course catalogs are state specific. They are. So in Ohio, what is supposed to be in the course catalog is completely different than Texas, very different than Texas, uh, and very different than Georgia. So every state has, or every department of higher education has certain verbiage that they want in their course catalog, especially when it comes to refund policies or when it comes to a credit um, approval terminology and things like that. So remember how I told you some of the schools are called proprietary schools and other schools are called private schools and some are called career training schools. Well, if you were to refer to your school uh, incorrectly in your course catalog, they're going to reject it and ask you to refer to yourself with the proper name that the state adheres to. So that's just an example of how the course catalog is very state specific. So I'd be making videos all day long for that. Um, but anyway, the course catalog has a list of items that um, the student needs to, um, I'm gonna put you on mute, sorry. Um, the course catalog has a list of all the things that your students or students to be need to know in order to make an educated decision on whether or not they wanna come to your program. 
So think about your course catalog as a list of all the programs you offer. Even though right now you're only thinking about phlebotomy and maybe it's only, only gonna be phlebotomy in the beginning. But remember I told you, you have a license. You will have a license to operate a um, non-degree granting program. So you could have an HVAC program later. You could have um, a medical assistant program later, a massage therapy. So you would list out all those courses for students in the course catalog. Not only do you list out all the courses, but you also list out the instructors for those courses, uh, how long the course is, what kind of job the student can get after they go through your course, how do they get certified after they take your course. You also put in your course catalog information about refunds, payment plans, uh, how to withdraw from your program, all types of things. So you have all different types of policies and procedures, like what are your attendance policies and et cetera. So all of those things go in the course catalog. The course catalog, depending on the state, can be anywhere from a 12 to 30 page document. So it is very in depth. Usually the state will give you a checklist on what they want in the course catalog, and then they look to you to create the verbiage to create that course catalog. Next is the enrollment form. The enrollment form also is referred to as the enrollment agreement. And this is basically an application to go to your program. So students will have to fill out uh, an enrollment form, but you guessed it, the enrollment form has to have specific information on it depending on your state. And they also have certain things you have to disclose to your student while they're enrolling. Because in many states, if you don't disclose certain things to your student before they enroll, and then they enroll in your program and they learn that information afterwards, that information could have been uh, a deciding factor as to whether or not they're going to actually go to your program. So if you didn't tell them early on, and then they found out later, they could possibly uh, cancel the agreement, the enrollment agreement without any repercussions and you have to give them all of their money back. So it's really important that you look at the student enrollment agreement and you align it with what the state wants and that you have all the things that the state requires and even more to not only protect the student but also to protect you. So, um, Diana says it is hard to combine all courses in the catalog. Um, no, it's not hard. You just, the thing is, you just take a moment to outline each course. So let's say you have three courses. Um, you would have one little section that says courses we offer. And then you would name massage therapy, CNA, phlebotomy, right? And then the next one might say course description. Okay, then you go CNA and you describe the course and what they can expect. You say phlebotomy, you describe the course and what to expect. And then you'd say massage therapy, you describe it. There's gonna be another section that says course hours. Then you say phlebotomy, these are our course hours. So you just keep going through very methodical and um, make sure that you separate them all out individually so students can know they'll go underneath that particular section and they can look to see what information um, is about that particular program that they're looking for. So that's how I would do it. Um, I have seen some people try to do it um, CNA program, and then they'll go and say course description, course hours, program objectives, uh, enrollment criteria, and they'll go down all for CNA, and then they'll go the next one, phlebotomy, and then they'll try to put all of those. I don't recommend that because that's going to be very hard for the student to navigate and hard for you to put that inside of your, um, your table of contents because your table of contents is going to have five different pages for five different descriptions. Does that make sense? Oh, that's how you was doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's why it was hard. So yeah, you have to, um, you, I would do it the way I explained the first time. Um, but anyway, back to the enrollment agreement or the enrollment form. Um, usually there's some type of attestation at the very end of the enrollment agreement. Uh, at the end of that enrollment agreement, it's asking the student to agree that they did read the enrollment agreement in its entirety, that they do uh, agree to what they read and that they did actually take a look at the course catalog. In many states, the student had to have looked at the course catalog before they signed an enrollment agreement. Again, that's another thing. If they didn't see the, the course catalog and they signed up, they could be able to retract and get all their money back. So um, your attestation should say something along the lines of, I have seen the course catalog, I understand the course catalog, I agree to the course catalog, and I'm signing my name on the dotted line for those purposes. Um, next is the program outline. Uh oh, is that Miss um, Tan? Hey, hey, Tana, how you doing? Thanks for joining. I'm good. Thank you. 
Um, we are um, about halfway done, but we're just going through the different documents that are required, okay? All righty. All right. Um, next is the, and if you could mute yourself for me, please. Thank you. Um, next is the program outline. So the program outline is for the students and for the instructors. So it actually gives both of you an idea of what's going to happen day by day. So when you look at the, the program outline, it should say on day one, these are the topics, these are the page numbers, these are the assignments. Day two, these are the topics, these are the page number, these are the assignments, and et cetera. Um, that helps students understand what to anticipate when um, things are due, when tests are coming, and et cetera, and it helps the instructor know those things as well. So program outline does take a while. You actually would probably want to write your program curriculum first before you do the outline, if an outline is even required in your state. Please note, an outline may not be required in some states. So when I showed you earlier to go to your state and look through all the documents that they say they require, only fill out and create things that they want. Now, if you want a course outline for your own personal reasons, then you can create one, but just know if your state did not require it, then you won't have to do it. Um, next is the program curriculum. You have to write the program curriculum so you guys can teach from it, but many states sometimes don't want it. And um, I know Texas, weirdly enough, is one of them. They don't necessarily want to see your curriculum. Um, I've, I've had people in Texas get their schools approved for the phlebotomy program and then call me like, I don't know as a teacher what to do, <laughs> which I think is very interesting. So um, we have to often write them a curriculum so they know what to teach, what hot points to make sure they touch on so the students can pass the NHA exam. Um, just teaching from the book usually is not enough. Um, who remembers going to school? And the teacher is just teaching you everything. And you're like, well, what part in here do I really need to pay attention to for the test? <laughs> and they don't necessarily tell you. That's how you'll be teaching your class. And that's annoying. So you want to make sure that you know the high points and you know the important things that, that students really need to take home so that they can be successful on the, on the national qualifying exam. So that's why the curriculum is important. All right, next is um, skills checkoff sheets. So there are quite a few different skills that your phlebotomist would need to know. Like we mentioned before, not only do they draw blood, but they also need to do different types of specimen collection, urine, blood, sputum. Um, they need to show that they know how to do a finger prick, you know, all types of different skills. So you would need to create a skills checkoff list for the students so they can go in their file and they can um, have everything check off or know what they need to learn. Um, there's also, not only do you need an overall checkoff list, but I would also even create um, kind of the steps for each skill. So let me give you an example. Let's say a student, one of the skills is a VNI puncture. Well, just saying VNI puncture on your check, your skills checklist is fine because I can check them off as the instructor and say, yeah, they did VNI puncture check. But what about me as the student? What if I need to know the steps to do a VNI puncture? I need to know Oh, okay, I need to gather my supplies first. That is um, an alcohol wipe, a gauze, a tourniquet, you know, a vacutainer, my, my different tubes. And I need to make sure that <clears throat> I have a piece of little, uh, what's a little uh, ammonia nearby. I need to know that I need to have all these things. And then I go into it. Okay, first I identify a vein, then I tie, um, tie my tourniquet on, then I clean the area. That's second nature to us but it is not second nature to someone trying to learn this for the first time. So you do need to have written out step-by-step step what needs to be done for each skill that the student is um, checking off on. And that again is something you would need to create. The state, the, the Department of Higher Education, they're only an entity that gives you a license to operate a school. They don't know, they don't have nothing to do with how you run your program, it's up to you to determine that, which is uh, very different from CNA programs. Any questions about the required state documents before I move on? None? Okay. Well, if I don't have any other questions, this is actually, um, we're at the end. <clears throat> How I can help? Well, we are having a seminar uh, May 1st through 3rd for how to start a phlebotomy school in Ohio. So what we do during the seminar 
is I literally walk you through A to Z on getting your school approved. So all of those, um, let me go to Ohio's website again. Um, all of the things that you saw on the checklist, we would complete together. <clears throat> um, a lot. One of the biggest things I see that people have a lot of problem with when they're um, trying to get their school approved is like, how much should I charge? And what all should be included? And how do I create my first year projections? How do I know how much money I'll make in the first year? How many students do I need to break even? Um, there's all types of things that people should be thinking about that they sometimes don't necessarily think about. So um, during our three-day seminar, we do that. And we create all these documents. So we would create your course catalog, your enrollment agreement. Um, we would do your instructor resumes because they do have to be a certain way for approval. Uh, we would talk about surety bonds and et cetera. So everything on this list, we would go through and complete during, the, during our three days together. <clears throat> Typically when people um, leave the seminar, they are pretty much prepared to submit their application. The only thing that you're usually missing is your location, your equipment, um, and then maybe like sometimes people don't have all their instructors quite yet. Um, and that's okay. You know, as long as you have everything else, you just got to get some additional instructors in place. That's fine. Um, and then that's, that's typically it, getting the location ready and getting your uh, inspection and stuff for your location. Um, I did not speak on contracts for clinicals. So believe it or not, phlebotomy programs do not require clinicals. They don't. So students could learn on each other in the lab, and that is their clinical, as long as they get real live experience on a live person. Now, if you want to have your program to have clinicals at a location, so let's say you get an agreement with LabCorp or uh, Quest or something like that for your students to come there to do their clinical hours and get some sticks in, that's great, because now they get to know what it's like to work with real people, but it is not required for, their, for the program. Just know that. Uh, but you would have to write that in your course catalog. So in your course catalog, you'd have to explain to students that they are going to get hands-on learning on each other in the lab and not on random people in the street. And um, there's always somebody that's like, oh my God, really? They're going to be sticking each other? Yeah. If, if, they don't, if they have a problem with someone sticking them, then they don't need to be in the program. <laughs> that's, that doesn't even make sense. All right. Hey, Tana, you had a question? I do. Um, huh. Can can nurses teach this or do I have to have uh, a phlebotomist teach it? Yep, good question. Um, let me share my screen again. I'm gonna go back to that part. I think because you came in a little late. Oh, but, I'm sorry. But it's okay, it wasn't just you. Somebody else came in a little late too. Okay, so um, any of your instructors have to have at least one year of experience. They should be nationally certified. Uh, if they're a phlebotomist or a medical assistant, if they are an RN or LPN, they just need a license and proof that they were actually drawing blood underneath that license. Um, I did not put it here, but an EMT or a, a paramedic could also qualify because they have to know how to do that too. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. no problem. Any other questions? Okay. Well, let me go back here. Um, if, you, if you can't make the May session and you're like, you know, Victoria, I, I wanna come do a seminar, but May is not gonna work for me. Um, I need a different date. Well, you can always email us. You can schedule your own session. So we have these dates because people schedule them. So you could schedule your own session. Just email us at info at thesecretcocktail.com and say, I want, I'm in Ohio. I wanna do a three-day seminar. What days do you have available? I will tell you right now, though, we are booked out until August, so I will, we would not be able to do any seminars until August, but I'm happy to help you then. Yes, Angela. How do you register for the May seminar? Uh, great question. I should have put that in the chat. So um, let me pull up the link. There's a link, and let me get it up for you. Um, so you can sign up directly on our website. Um, actually, let me take that back. So on our website, on the 1st through the 4th, it's actually a CNA and phlebotomy school seminar. 
But some people don't want to do CNA and phlebotomy. They only want to do phlebotomy. So if you only want to do the phlebotomy part, then I suggest um, you use this link that I'm going to put in the in the chat. And during your checkout, you just say, I'm in Ohio and I only want to do the phlebotomy part. And so you would come the first three days rather than all four. And um, during the seminar, we do take care of your um, accommodations. So uh, your, your hotel stay is included, um, as well as meals, uh, breakfast and lunch on the first day. So I just put the link in the chat for you. So you would not click the Ohio seminar, but you would just schedule your own seminar and say you're coming to the one in Ohio. Uh, put the dates in the notes and that you only want to do phlebotomy. Excuse me. So where at in Ohio will this be? It's, at, it's going to be in Atlanta, but it's a three-day oh. event to help you get the school started in Ohio. Oh, okay, great. Mm -hmm. I'm not far from Atlanta. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, Ms. Blake, yes. So that was my question because I was interested in the CNA portion also. So you said you can um, end the phlebotomy in Ohio. So you say it's four days versus three, correct? Right. If you want the Ohio, if you want the CNA and phlebotomy, I just put that link um, in the chat because uh, the CNA has a totally different body of approval for the CNA program in addition to um, the Ohio College Commission. So we would also have to get approval through, I think it's the Department of Health also. So it's, it's like three different applications, which is why we need four days to complete all that. So I put the link in the um, chat for that one for you also. <coughs> <laughs> All right, Diana. Yeah, so I, I was wondering, um, like with the phlebotomists, do they need to have the um, CPR training? Um, it's not required, just like with CNA phlebotomy, um, the CPR is not required. It is a nice addition because as we all know, they're probably going to need it in order to get a job but it's not required. So that's a part of you writing your own curriculum the way you want. And if you want to add in a day for that, you could, and you can charge for that. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Did everyone get um, access to the links in the chat? or had any problems accessing them. <clears throat> All right, if not, I thank you so much for joining me. Um, if you went through this presentation, you go home and you start doing research and then you have additional questions, please email me. Uh, I am happy to answer those questions any way that I can help, I'm happy to. I'll put the email address again in the chat. Because if you're like me, I get information and then I go research a little more. And of course, my research always leads me to find more things that I have more questions about. Um, so if, if the state can't help you, I'm happy to. <clears throat> and that is the link there. This is your last chance. Any more questions? All right, well, if not, thank you ladies so much for joining me. I appreciate your time and you guys have a nice evening. Bye.